together. Uh, thank you. Loudness, loudness. For um, so as you know, this is December. This is the December of Canada Gather. Uh, we're very excited to have two incredible speakers, uh, Dashita Dawson and uh, Roy Bingham. So thank you both for coming. In the meantime, I'd love to give a special shout out uh, to the team. Uh, Ronnie, right there, who you'll meet uh, in a little bit. Sam, right there, doing the A and B right here. Uh, Tiana. Hello. I feel like I missed Don somewhere over there, but there's Thomas. We found a Thomas. Thomas is providing all the drinks that you guys are enjoying. Yes, Thomas. Yes, Thomas. Uh, Cal, who you probably met on the way in, also the creator of our lovely logo. Uh, shout out to Cal, whatever you may be. Uh, and we got Thomas, who's also doing check in, the other Thomas. Uh, and. Uh, uh, Jackie couldn't be here with us, um, but obviously leading our social media initiatives. Um, so thank you to the entire team, Sanjay, who couldn't be here. Uh, and then last but not least, we have Kim, uh, who yeah. was on the And um, we'll, we'll kick it off with Kim in a second, but before we do, I uh, just want to acknowledge our sponsors. Uh, so we'll just go down the line. Uh, Casa Verde Capital, uh, as you know, Snoop Dogg's venture capital firm who's on our board, uh, your CBD oils. Uh, so Craig, uh, you may have met him outside. If you haven't met him outside, uh, he will come on stage right now uh, and introduce himself. So Craig, thank you so much. Hey, Josh. Hi, Hi. I'm good. What a pleasure to be here. As always, thank you. Stop coming home. <laughs> uh, anyway, anyway, your CBD oils is the finest purveyor of CBD oils made from 100% organic chemicals. We have CBD oils for people and pets. CBD oils are the elixir of life. We're all working with our endocannabinoid system. We start replacing the cannabinoids that we become deficient in. So it's also a viable alternative to medicinal marijuana. CBD oils will neutralize the effects of too much THC. Our goal is to educate the world about the benefits of hemp and provide the best products for them. We have it in vape oil. We have the oral drops, oral spray, CBD bombs, vitamins, everything else. Everything else. Everything. 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 Dogs and cats. So if you get a chance, please visit my website, your CBD oils, become educated, so you can make an educated decision about CBD oils. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. If you're interested in CBD oils, uh, so you can Craig. If your dog or cat is interested and expresses their interest to you, talk to Craig. If you don't have a dog or a cat, go to a shelter and get one and then talk to Craig. Um, it's actually pretty straightforward and easy. Um, you should just talk to Craig. Uh, Hamptons, uh, Medi Spa, uh, some of you may have met her before. Uh, Liz Kramer Ernst uh, couldn't hear, be here with us. Uh, she's actually in Boston with a patient right now. Um, she's incredible, doing amazing work. She does uh, telemedicine, so if you're interested in uh, getting a car here in New York, uh, she can certify you uh, with her. Uh, she's an RN, um, so as you know, nurses can offer certificates, so go to Hamptons Medispa, talk to Liz, <coughs> super easy process, all online. Uh, thank you, Hamptons Medispa, for her support. Uh, and Dr. Hartridge, uh, is Dr. Hartridge here? No. Puerto Rico. She's in Puerto Rico. Okay, so also, uh, helping patients, uh, Dr. Harbridge uh, donates truffles, as you know and have enjoyed. Uh, and if you haven't, then you have to come back next time. Sorry, yeah, come back next time. Um, so she's awesome. So check out her, her work at just Google Dr. Harbridge and you'll be able to find her website. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I think without further ado, I'd love to kick it to Kim for some news as she'll share. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Gather round. Welcome to the wild world of weed. I'm your plug for news and events. This is Cannabis with Kim B. <laughs> Marylanders are days away from being able to legally buy medical marijuana. After, <laughs> after many legal and bureaucratic stalls, Maryland's medical marijuana market has officially opened. 
so far, 8,500 Marylanders have been approved to buy their medicine. Here's hoping to the red tape is over so patients can access their medicine. Hashtag, I'll smoke to that. It's sold out, I just saw it, it was a big update. It's sold out. Canada just passed the bill to legalize recreational marijuana. Yeah. Canada just passed the bill to join Uruguay in legalizing recreational cannabis across the country. Legalization is slated to begin on Canada Day, July 1st, 2018. Suddenly, thousands of Americans are planning their 4th of July vacations <laughs> north of the border. Hashtag, oh Canada. <laughs> California's new edible limits will ban popular products. Wow. Starting January 1st, 2018, California edibles must be capped at 100 milligrams of THC. The move is to protect adults, but mostly children, from ingesting. The move comes on the heels of one absent-minded dad's planning that led to what was described as the best sixth grade birthday party ever <laughs> by pretty much everyone in attendance. <laughs> Hashtag, but seriously, don't dose kids. <laughs> Marijuana prices are plunging in Colorado, and that could be bad news. Analysts from The Economist found that the price per pound of cannabis sunk from 2000 to 1300 Further, analysts suggest that big businesses in states are weighing down prices by God, up license. Wait, big business acting in their own interest in spite of the market? Hashtag, no fucking way. <laughs> Mental note, take road trip to Colorado. <laughs> Murphy wins, Murphy wins boost prospects for legal marijuana in New Jersey. <laughs> New Jersey is poised to become the ninth state in the legalized, legalized recreational cannabis. The decision comes from Governor-elect Phil Murphy and his cabinet that includes chief of staff and who is also the head of Marijuana Trade Group. All this optimistic talk is leaving New Jersey's proud 8 million residents in more than a usual hashtag garden state of mind. <laughs> Here are the rules for legal marijuana in Cal California once the law goes into effect January 1st. California marked a significant milestone ahead of its January legalization with the release of its regulations. The rules appear to be rather standard in regards to school zones, hours of operation, and other issues. The release has prompted many to ask out loud, wait, California isn't legal already? Hashtag California love. Thanks, guys. I think that might have been the best one so far. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, are you guys? I want to thank Andrew. Andrew, are you in here? So, Andrew, I curate the news, and Andrew helps write it because wow. we know that Kim Lee is very wordy. So, Andrew yeah. is the writer, and he helps me produce the content. So, thank you. Uh, I forgot a, two quick things. One, um, Dej. Dej. Uh, so Dej is with uh, Tribe Tokes and Tribe Pets. So stand up. Round of applause. And you'll find out why. Uh, so Dej and Tribe Tokes uh, has offered to supply our after party with free goodies in the form of uh, some tats and some <laughs> Christmas uh, cards. Do we it. have marijuana Christmas cards that are and silver poly tattoos we're doing for free at that. Right? Awesome, thank you. That was, that was another round of applause. Uh, and then as you all know, uh, there's a host committee option, uh, which is a pack of four tickets. Uh, and a lot of people purchase them, uh, so uh, thanks for doing that. Uh, what are you guys, Lucas? Yeah. That's Lucas right here. Thank you very much, Lucas. For the floor, uh, we got Ed. Uh, Ed is... Ed? Okay. Uh, Ed, thank you. 
Um, oh, there he is. You're hiding. I see you. <laughs> I see you. Uh, Greenville Farms. Greenville Farms. Thank you, Madeline. Awesome. Thank you, Madeline. And then uh, Presto Doctor. Where's the Presto Doctor? Right there. Thank you guys very much. Uh, so we're going to give uh, CBD oils of Long Island a uh, uh, $50 tincture, courtesy of a prank to each of you guys. So thank you. Uh, we couldn't do it without all of your support. Um, so thank you. And then uh, we usually try to feature a local uh, startup. Obviously, we have some pretty, pretty big uh, brand names speaking as our keynotes. Uh, but we also have a pretty exciting company uh, that's local. Uh, you guys, yeah, as you probably guess. Um, come in here to speak, and, and I'll let uh, Ronnie take it away to, to make that introduction. So before we get started, how many people here, is this your first event? Well done! Keep your hand up here because of New Jersey going recreation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Jersey, baby. Jersey, baby. Jersey, baby. So we're going to bring some Jersey boys up here to show you what's going on in the cannabis industry in New Jersey. Um, a lot of folks that are here today are here because they want to become entrepreneurs. That's why I came to my first meeting. Um, well, I, I wanted to do a bunch of things, now I figured out after a year what I want to do. So this is the start for a lot of you. Um, one of the companies we're going to bring up is proof that you don't have to necessarily touch the plant in order to make money in the cannabis industry. Um, if you look at Colorado, and if anyone from Colorado is in here, you can correct me. Um, in 2015, yeah, we have a dispensary owner in the corner right there, right? So, correct me if I'm wrong, in um, 2015, they made about a billion dollars in sales in, in terms of touching the plant. Do you know how much they made off the ancillary services that support the cannabis industry? Anybody know? I used to be a teacher, so I'm going to keep asking questions. <laughs> $1.5 billion. That means that the industry that supports cannabis made more money than the actual industry. So we're gonna, there you go, yeah. yes. yes. So you don't necessarily have to get a license. Now we're gonna bring up a local company from New Jersey and they're gonna talk about their technology, they're gonna talk about their journey in the cannabis space and they're showing proof that um, you don't have to touch the plant but you can support it and make a decent, well, we're, they're about to make a, 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 an explosive, um, they're going to crush it. With this. Yeah, they're going to crush it with this technology. <laughs> so I'd like to bring up, give them a hand. I'd like to get, bring up Liberty Bag, the owners of Liberty Bag, John and Kyle Franny. Welcome. Woo! 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 How you guys doing? They came all the way from New Jersey. What part of New Jersey? Central Jersey, Bridgewater. Bridgewater, New Jersey. That's a long drive. So give them a hand for coming up here. Thank you very much. So before we get started, uh, I want to congratulate Kyle. Uh, Kyle's the, uh, the uh, assistant, not the, uh, the athletic director. The athletic director for Somerville High School. They just won the state championship, so let's give him some props for that. <laughs> now we're going to talk about a technology that they've created over time um, that's going to revolutionize uh, cannabis in terms of making sure that these products are safe for consumers. Um, but before we get into that, tell us how you got into cannabis. Uh, this is my father sitting to the left. My name is Kyle Franey. Uh, I, we kind of happened into this industry. Uh, my father retired very recently, uh, part of the reason is to get into this industry. Uh, but he, for 47 years, was the distinguished member of the technical staff of Bell Laboratories uh, in New Jersey, the National Lab. So he is a, he's a chemist um, with uh, 35 patents in the United States and abroad. So he brings legitimate uh, really legitimacy to the industry and the technology it brings. Uh, in the late 80s, uh, he was the, uh, the lead uh, corrosion researcher. And those of you old enough to remember the Statue of Liberty in the, in the mid to late 80s, there was scaffolding around it and it was disgusting to look at simply because of some of the things that were going on with the statue. Uh, and Lee Iacocca started a project to, to, to fix the statue, not only that, but to reskin it. Uh, and to create uh, the statuary that we all know and love today. And this guy sitting here was uh, the one responsible on July 4, 1986. The New York Times, the New York Post, the entire back page was dedicated to him. So uh, he, from that, uh, you know, kind of the lighthearted story behind it is uh, my mother, the next Thanksgiving, 
uh, you know, we were on the island with 47 people, including President Reagan and other people, and my mother said, you're so fucking smart that you can fix the Statue of Liberty, but every year I've got to polish the silverware. I just don't understand why for Thanksgiving. So he said, eh, I can fix that. So he took a Ziploc bag, and he put a piece of reactive copper down in it, uh, and as it was so kindly expressed, I'm an educator, I don't know shit about this stuff, but uh, a year later, my mother took the silver out, ready to tell him that he was a crazy scientist, and lo and behold, uh, there was no polishing needed, simply because the copper in the bag uh, really acted as a sacrificial agent, so it reacted with all the negative gases in the air, the sulfurs, the chlorines, and everything that was in that air. So from that, over the years, from 1986 to present, uh, a company was developed that uh, has created numerous products that uh, uses this technology. Uh, quite simply, it's made in the United States uh, completely. Uh, we make the product here in factories here, uh, and we create a film that then can be extruded in various ways um, to protect electrostatic discharge, things like that. So initially, it was electronics that was going in this product. Uh, and all the f kind of the components and all the factors behind it, it made a lot of sense as we found out a couple of years ago that if you put cannabis, cannabis in it it, 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 it protects it. So some of the properties of it that if we think about it now, um, it's like full electrostatic discharge protective. So if you can think about that plastic bag that this industry so much loves, that Ziploc bag made in China, and all that green film that's on the outside, uh, no more. Uh, the inside of our bags have a film that is uh, a complete. Uh, he knows it very well. Yeah. Uh, this is clean. This well. bag is clean. Don't worry about it. So at the end of the day, our bags act uh, similar to a Rainex type approach, where um, you know chemically. And again, I'm not the guy to ask why. The only thing I know is uh, nothing sticks to the side. Um, by accident, I had a friend of mine that we had all these bags when I was in the basement as a kid, just to give you an idea. Uh, the company that was started outside of cannabis has sold 260 million bags. Let that sink in for a little bit. 260 million bags have been sold in various industries. We wrap up 16s. Uh, we provide the protection for flight boxes for NASA space shuttles. Um, so to give you an idea of, of what the product is capable of. Um, so basically, the, the, the long and short of it um, is this guy figured out how to take a Ziploc bag and you know, interweave in that matrix copper into that bag. Uh, and those copper ions that make up that Ziploc bag, that, uh, that bag that you can heat seal, that you can do all of the things that you want to do with a bag that holds cannabis. Um, uh, by happen chance, when I was a little bit younger, I had a friend of mine that used these bags. We had a lot of them in our basement. And, and he may have been being chased and may have thrown a bag of this stuff into the woods. And, and he may have come back eight months later and called me up and said, I don't know what those bags are, but, but eight months later, it's like a fine wine or cheese. It's a little bit better than when I put it in. You know, so we, we thought about it a little bit, and, and we also make this product for the music industry. So uh, if you're familiar with guitar playing, Diodario guitar strings, all their bags come, all their strings come in our bags. Uh, Zildjian Cymbals is the number one cymbal maker. And that's really where this kind of started from. We make the point of sale bags for their cymbals, and those guys that were smart enough to buy the cymbals from us, from the, you know, from Zildjian, uh, had a bag that they could heat seal, uh, that they protected their stuff. Uh, it kills powdery mildew on contact. Um, it, it, it mitigates mold. It doesn't allow for ethylene gas to build up. So if you think about, you know, that you put the product in it, and you open that Ziploc bag, and you impress your friends, it smells so great. That's a dead deer decaying on the side of the road. That's the last thing you want out of a bag. Our bags, you don't get that smell simply because the product that's in it, that, that air above the product has been conditioned by the bag, uh, and there's no breakdown of it. So ethylene gas is mitigated. You can stick bananas in that bag, and you'll see a real marked difference between those bananas on your counter and the bananas in our bag. So. Uh, doesn't stick to the side, kills mildew, uh, preserves it. Right now we're working with Bovida. We've got a couple of tests that are out there. Um, and Resco Labs in California is really the main lab testing this stuff. And they came back to let us know it kills salmonella, it kills MRSA, uh, it kills everything. You, copper is, you, Google doesn't lie, right? I mean, you type into Google the antimicrobial properties of copper. Um, the difference is this guy knows how to make a Ziploc bag out of it. Uh, no one else in this room, I would guess, would, could figure out how to do that, um, and he has. So that's, that's kind of where we're at today. 
Uh, we started last January into this venture with, uh, you know, a few people close to the situation. Uh, that guy's going to stand up, Leo Bridgewater in the back. Stand up. Um, we met him. We went to our first show, and uh, to say it was a hit was was kind of an understatement. Uh, and he was soaring us out. And we were on the radio with him. We were here. We were there. And he, he, he was going to introduce us to the world. And thankfully, he has. Uh, and that's kind of why we're sitting here today, uh, thanks to these guys. So um, again, I can talk about the product as much as I want. Um, you know, the real science, if we stick around later, if you want to talk about science and material science and everything else, um, is coming from this guy. So uh, we, he's going to add some legitimacy to the industry. Um, and we're going to provide storage. We've got three basic products, um, a five pound bag that you can line your row with. You can cure in it, you can store in it, you can do whatever you want, go back to it eight months later, a year later, and it's a little better than when you put it in. Uh, we've got an at-home bag, which some of these guys have, 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 you know, have in their hands, uh, and, and that's going to be about three quarters of a pound, your at-home storage, this guy. And on the inside, again, it's going to be a copper look on the inside. Uh, and then our, our, our latest product is we've got dispensary with this guy. Um, dispensary owners love this product. So the same technology is on the inside, um, but it's a full ASDM child proof, uh, child resistant bag. Uh, so that dispensary owners, when they're going to sell it across their counter, are probably going to put it in something that's, I don't want to say subpar, but again, we're putting it in plastic, we're putting it in glass. This is active packaging, okay? So this is going to kill powdery mildew, okay? This is gonna kill. The, Has anybody ever smoked anything with powdery mildew on it? You probably don't know. People who go like this are probably did. Because remember, we're not getting it from directly from a medical facility most of the time, right? Um, but what this technology does, it does protect consumers. And I want your dad to share a little bit about why he's actually in the cannabis space, like what's, because you could have said, okay, we figured that out, let's keep it moving. Why become this part of this community? What kind of, some of the benefits that you receive from learning in this community? Well, the interesting thing about it is, I'd like to go back to 1992, when uh, my partner and I formed the industrial part of this company and uh, went to market with the industrial uh, bag business and we've been, that's where the 60 million bags without one failure uh, have been populating the industry. Uh, it was somewhere about three or four years ago that we thought if we upped the copper content of the bag, uh, that it might do some interesting things because uh, Kyle had uh, been in wrestling for, I can't tell you how many decades, and as time progressed, Mercer became a very difficult type of uh, item to dispose of. Uh, killing, the, uh, killing those microbes became eh, a fairly, fairly important target for us. So my partner and I decided to try to go into the medical side by upping the copper content and changing some of our formulation that we normally would use for F-16 bags, uh, military, uh, electronics. You're all familiar with the electronics industry. Uh, they're the low version. They will not do what this bag does for the cannabis industry. But we went into the medical industry, and before we go further, we wanted to run testing. Our testing uh, wound up going down to uh, different hospital organizations, uh, University of Wisconsin, Medical Center ran testing, and RASCO was one of our last tests that we ran. But we test, tested various formulations and finally figured out uh, how to stop E. coli growth, uh, stop Mercer growth, stop powdery mildew growth. And the way we're doing it is we're releasing a certain amount of active copper ions in the bag that mitigate the growth cycle. So if you think of the half-life of these microbes, it's on the order of uh, 30 minutes or less to maybe 24 hours. And if you can stop them from reproducing by introducing a copper ion, you've solved the problem, and that's the way we do that. 
uh, we do that at levels that are so low that all of the materials we use are FDA compliant. There's nothing in the bag that's volatile. And this is what I'd like to point out. Ron had your blue bag up. If you want an anti-static bag like that, you need two things besides the polyethylene bag. You need some downy fabric softener and some blue food color. And that'll give you the bag as you soak it in that. And that's exactly what that material is. Uh, it will not do anything for you other than uh, to release a little bit of water uh, from the atmosphere into the product inside. We don't do that. Our bag is manufactured from solid state components, which means that the shelf life of the bag is over 20 years. It will release the Don't sell it. it only lasts a week, then you have to buy a new one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm just going to tell you facts. Uh, he's the marketing guy, <laughs> definitely. Uh, but I said shelf life now. Uh, the active life is pretty long. Uh, once you start using it, though, you're going to start using the, the bag. Uh, copper ions will mitigate the issues you're having. The other thing that's very important is this bag has the lowest moisture vapor transmission rate of any bag material that's ever been made. What that means is when you put anything into the bag at a certain humidity level, no water will come out of the bag that's measurable, and an unmeasurable amount will go into the bag from the outside atmosphere, which is uh, going to preserve the water content of the product that you have in there. So if you have any idea about, say, putting a kilogram of anything in the bag, after you leave it in the bag for a certain amount of period, reweigh it, you're going to get a kilogram back out. Now, you can figure out by your own finances what that means to you, but it really will mitigate any exchange of water in the bag and outside the bag. Uh, so those are, those are the main points that uh, we bring to the market. When we looked at this market, we uh, could not figure out why, why it was not mitigating these issues. And so uh, we sat back and Kyle came over to me one day and he said, you know, does it do this, does it do that? And he's, he's been listening over the years. And that's basically what got us into the market because he was aware of these issues. And then when we started looking at them, I said, well, yeah, of course we do that. And we do this, we do the other thing. So uh, when we looked at the market for what was uh, apparently available, there wasn't any active species type of mechanism for handling the issues that you've seen commonplace in here. And, and that's when we decided to get into it. So are you guys going to stick around today? Tonight? Yes. Yes. So I'll ask them questions, especially I'm sure people in the medical field want to know how this bag works, how can it help consumers, and he also mentioned ways that it can help business owners that are producing this product and, and, and continuing it. So um, give them a hand, thank you for your time. some of the folks who have been in the industry for a very long time, uh, folks that have been operating here uh, on the ancillary side uh, or potentially working out west, and then bringing some of the, the 
highest class folks from out west here. Uh, and we were very fortunate enough to have both of those individuals. Uh, we have Tashita Dawson, uh, and then we have Roy Bingham. Um, so Tashita, I'll let her introduce herself, and then Roy, I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, so if they're both available to come up, uh, thank you so much to both of you for coming. Uh, cool. So thank you both for coming. I guess we'll kick it off with Dashita. Um, so how did you get into the cannabis industry? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi. Uh, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, 
Um, so I was sort of coerced to come into the space. Of course, very quickly I realized how big the opportunity was. And actually I'd been checking it out. So five years ago I came to a meeting here at Marijuana Business Media's first meeting in New York, and about 23 people in a room, and like one person wearing a suit. Um, were you the one person? Yeah, I think I was, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I decided, no, no, it's not quite time yet for me. It took me about two more years, uh, and then I jumped in with both feet and started uh, BDS Handling. Cool, that's awesome. And by the way, thank you, Heather, for, for making this happen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Heather. Thank you, my boss, for uh, the directors. Um, so yeah, I think you have a good sense of, of where you come. Oh, and then where did you go to business school? Mm. I went to Harvard. Okay, so we got some some pretty established universities. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? I said it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> I, hear it's, I hear it's like number two or three in the, on the undergrad side. Yeah. It's a very very strong business school. Yes, so yeah. At least in the top three, I feel like we're in the yeah. HBS sort of fight for number one. The fact that you're having to talk about it so much is just something. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this is the second time in a row where everyone in the audience knows something and is laughing at me. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Okay. So um, I, I guess well, one quick question, uh, just piggybacking off, off the background, is have you noticed a change from when you started in the industry uh, until now in terms of folks from your alma mater and friend circles in terms of how they uh, interface with you or talk about the industry or talk about what you do? Yeah, you bet. So, you know, I started off very conventional. I was in banking and finance in London, and then I came over here, then I worked for McKinsey, that big boring consulting firm, did all the Fortune 100 type of stuff. Then I got into the natural foods industry, and that was interesting because people were still wearing sandals and they were really <laughs> enthusiastic for the products about 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, in little independent health food stores, Whole Foods only had about 19 stores or something when I got started. Uh, and so when I came to this space, I, you know, I was relatively, oh, this kind of feels like the natural foods industry of 10 or 15 years ago. Now, what happened in natural foods is, of course, we're very corporate over time, and organic foods got codified and legislated and all the rest of it. And now, you know, some of the soul has gone out of uh, the natural foods industry, I think, as big business has, has taken over. But at least there are comprehensive offerings that are available in, you know, Whole Foods has 440 stores. Um, so, what I've noticed in the cannabis industry is that's happening only even faster, and especially out west, and I spend most of my time in Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and California, um, and so you're seeing the same kind of people with the shooter's background, uh, CPG coming into the industry, and very quickly brands being established and beginning to look like mainstream brands and conventional marketing starting to happen and normal business practices and people coming in on the growing production side with serious laboratory backgrounds and experience like these guys. So it's happening fast. Same question? Sure, so um, I think that um, I'm slightly different because I um, come from Brooklyn, New York, and I come Ooh. from an environment that for real, for real, like, um, you know, I'm, I'm not supposed to be doing anything with weed, let's be real. Like, so, um, I, I feel I still battle with that often, and I purposely stepped into the state not just to say that I'm an advocate and I'm a businesswoman and I'm using all of my strategic capabilities to help me brand the industry, but I'm also a user as well. And I think that that changes the conversation completely because I can speak from the consumer perspective as well. Um, lately, I have found since New Jersey um, and some of the politics that are going down there, and that's partly why I'm here, but since New Jersey is starting to make this shift, I'm starting to see Rutgers and Princeton come around. Um, and we'll see some events uh, really come from those institutions in 2018, and definitely I'll be a part of it. Um, because you know, they're coming to me as a person who is sort of the expert. I would say I in no means feel like an expert. I feel like an expert in my field, and there is a huge hole in terms of the amount of people who are talking about it, writing about it, teaching about it, and actually really doing it and seeing success on that PL as well. And, and I'm not just talking about the companies, I'm talking about the municipalities 
Because real talk, I go to Denver, Oregon, and I'm in the, the, in the uh, various counties and municipalities, and they're still struggling to figure out how to balance the PL. How do we make it profitable even in there? So, you know, in, 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 each, in each city, in each state. So, I'm focused more there because I think we can make it profitable and we can do it once big businesses come in, which will be inevitable for the consumer products. But um, the key is how do we make it profitable at a municipality? And that's where it seems like everyone now is starting to come in. Cool, that makes sense. So um, I guess let's, let's pick it back to Tashida and then we'll jump into to Roy's slides. So do you have a big sense of, of sort of your background and how things are changing? I guess more specifically, like what are the types of work that you both are doing? And I'm assuming we'll see it in the presentation. Um, and then what is MJM up to? Like, could you share um, some of the, the client base and the specific work that you're working on? Absolutely. So when I first jumped in, I, I just started with brands, right? So like I found something if I liked the actual product and I felt like they needed a little help with the positioning and a little help with the social media, that I would probably be the person that could help them. Um, then I, I, I really built a strategic plan for myself um, as a brand. I'm the Weed Head. Um, I purposely picked that name. You can find me at theweedhead.com uh, really because I wanted to change that perspective of what a Weed Head was. Um, MJM strategy focuses on brands, yes, but more recently, like I said, there have been more uh, municipalities and government entities and nonprofits that are trying to figure out the P and L piece of it, um, even in seasoned states, if you will, uh, that are being quoted here. And then there are new states that are coming on, Florida, and, uh, New Jersey, Maryland, that oftentimes uh, someone like myself as a general manager is just coming in and figure out again that. particularly on the East Coast, because there are a lot of stories that still are left to be told. I spend a lot of the time trying to, yes, find the facts, and so I'm, I'm pretty stoked that I'm here with them, because I joined NCIA <laughs> simply just so I could have access to the information, because this is how I did business and targeted at Victoria's Secret, with POS data, um, requirement, point of sale POS. Um, and so to have that, and that's what BDS Analytics does, it allows us to make really important data-driven product development decisions uh, uh, from the digital strategy, your positioning a lot. And so oftentimes I will leverage the fact that I have access to that to help build the initial strategy for my businesses. And even uh, my businesses being my clients, I think they're going to my mind because I want them to win. Um, but also the municipalities as well. They want to understand really how this directly reflects the sale. That it's not just the you know what you see in the news. You actually need the data to be able to tell that story. And then in terms of personal branding, I feel like uh, raise your hand if you're already in the industry. Oh, raise your hand if you're trying to get into the industry. Cool. Okay, so fifty fifty. So what are the the key recommendations that you offer from a personal branding or from a corporate branding standpoint um, to those folks that want to bring in? I think the first thing is it's the digital world folks. Like, you know, we are uh, still catching up and I think there's a lot of opportunity in the industry um, to the cybersecurity and some of the digital aspect, but it starts with us as individuals. So come out on social media, even if it's just as an advocate. Um, in New York is really hard. I'm used to markets where it's already like, okay, you're out. And then if you're a person of color, real talk, it immediately is like, okay, you use it. But be very clear about what your message is. Position it so that it's not perpetuating the old stereotypes. Not for nothing, I still, I'm from Brooklyn, from East New York. Like, I still say star, and like, there's no thing that I do. At the end of the day, I still a Brooklyn girl, but I am trying to dispel this. We are trying to dispel this. So ensure that you're not continuing to perpetuate those same stereotypes when you're actually passing on your messages. It took me about two more years, uh, and then I jumped in with both feet and started the uh, BDS Hamlet. Cool. That's awesome. And by the way, thank you, Heather, for, for making this happen. Yeah, thank you, Heather. 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 Thank you, Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Heather. 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 Thank you, Heather.
hear it's like number two or three in the, on the undergrad side. It's a very, very strong business school. At least in the top three, I feel like Gordon and SHBS sort of fight for number one. The fact that you're having to talk about it so much suggests something. <laughs> I feel like this is the second time in a row where everyone in the audience knows something and is laughing at me. I don't know what it is. Okay. So um, I guess well, one quick question, uh, just piggybacking off the, off the background, is have you noticed a change from when you started in the industry uh, until now in terms of folks from your alma maters and friend circles in terms of how they uh, interface with you or talk about the industry or talk about what you do? Yeah, you bet. So, you know, I started off very conventional. I was in banking and finance in London, and then I came over here, then I worked for McKinsey, that big boring consulting firm, did all the Fortune 100 type of stuff. Then I got into the natural foods industry, and that was interesting because people were still wearing sandals and they were really accusing us for the products about 20 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, in little independent health food stores, Whole Foods only had about 19 stores or something when I got started. Uh, and so when I came to this space, I was, you know, I was relatively, oh, this kind of feels like the natural foods industry of 10 or 15 years ago. Now, what happened in natural foods is, of course, it went very corporate over time, and organic foods got codified and legislated and all the rest of it. And now, you know, some of the soul has gone out of the natural foods industry, I think, as big business has, has taken over. But at least there are comprehensive offerings that are available in, you know, Whole Foods has 440 stores or something. Um, so, what I've noticed in the cannabis industry is that's happening only even faster, and especially out west, and I spend most of my time in Colorado, Washington, Oregon, and California, um, and so you're seeing the same kind of people with the shooter's background and CPG coming into the industry, and very quickly brands being established and beginning to look like mainstream brands and conventional marketing starting to happen and normal business practices and people coming in on the grown production side with serious laboratory backgrounds and experience like these guys. So it's happening for us. Any question? Sure, so um, I think that um, I'm slightly different because I um, come from Brooklyn, New York, and I come Ooh. from an environment that for real, for real, like, you know, I'm, I'm not supposed to be doing anything with weed, let's be real. Like, so, um, I, I feel I still battle with that often, and I've purposely stepped into the state not just to say that I'm an advocate and I'm a businesswoman and I'm using all of my strategic capabilities to help rebrand the industry, but I'm also a user as well. And I think that that changes the conversation completely because I can speak from the consumer perspective as well. Um, lately, I have found since New Jersey um, and some of the politics that are going down there, and that's probably why I'm here, but since New Jersey is starting to make this shift, I'm starting to see Rutgers and Princeton come around. Um, and we'll see some events uh, really come from those institutions in 2018, and definitely I'll be a part of it. Um, because, you know, they're coming to me as a person who is sort of the expert. I would say I in no means feel like an expert. I feel like an expert in my field, and there is a huge hole in terms of the amount of people who are talking about it, writing about it, teaching about it, and actually really doing it and seeing success on that P&L as well. And I'm not just talking about the companies, I'm talking about the municipalities. Because real talk, I go to Denver and Oregon, and I'm in the, the, in the uh, various counties and municipalities, and they're still struggling to figure out how to balance the P&L, how to make it profitable even in it. So, you know, in, 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 each, in each city, in each state. So I'm focused more there, because I think we can make it profitable, and we can do it once big businesses come in, which will be inevitable for the consumer products. But um, the key is how do we make it profitable at a municipality level? And that's where it seems like everyone now is starting to come in. Cool, that makes sense. So um, I guess let's, let's get back to the sheet and then we'll jump into to Roy's slides. So do you have a good sense of, of sort of your background and how things are changing? I guess more specifically, like what are the types of work that people are doing? And I'm assuming we'll see it in the presentation. 
Um, and then what is MJF up to? Like, could you share um, some of the, the client base and the specific work that you're working on? Absolutely. So when I first jumped in, I, I just started with brands, right? So like I found something, if I liked the actual product, and I felt like they needed a little help with the positioning and a little help with the social media, that I would probably be the person that could help them. Um, then I, I, I really built a strategic plan for myself um, as a brand. I'm the WeHead. Um, I purposely picked that name. You can find it at theweehead.com, uh, really because I wanted to change that perspective of what a WeHead was. Um, MJM strategy focuses on brands, yes, but more recently, like I said, there have been more uh, municipalities and government entities and nonprofits that are trying to figure out the P and L piece of it, um, even in seasoned states, if you will, uh, that are being quoted here. And then there are new states that are coming on, Florida and uh, New Jersey, Maryland, that oftentimes uh, someone like myself as a general manager is coming in to figure out, again, that p and um, and how it will work overall. Um, yeah, I think that uh, for the most part, I feel like I'm doing a lot of personal branding as well and putting myself in the space on purpose. I would recommend if you're new to the space, there's still a lot of time to do that, particularly on the East Coast, because there are a lot of stories that still are left to be told. I spend a lot of the time trying to, yes, find the facts, and so I'm, I'm pretty stoked that I'm here with them because I joined NCIA simply <laughs> just so I can have access to the information because this is how I did business at Target and Victoria's Secret with POS data, um, requirement, point of sale POS, by the way. Um, and so to have that, and that's what BDS Analytics does, it allows us to make really important data-driven product development decisions uh, uh, from the digital strategy, your positioning a lot. And so oftentimes, I will leverage the fact that I have access to that to help build the initial strategy for my businesses. And even uh, my businesses being my clients, I think that goes with my clients, I want to put um, but also the municipality as well. They want to understand really how this directly reflects the sale. That it's not just the you know what you see in the news. You actually use the data to be able to tell that story. And then in terms of personal branding, I feel like um, raise your hand if you're already in the industry. Oh. Raise your hand if you're trying to get into the industry. Cool. Okay, so 50-50. So what are the the key recommendations that you'd offer from a personal branding or from a corporate branding standpoint um, to those folks that want to break in? I think the first thing is it's the digital world, folks. Like, you know, we are uh, still catching up, and I think there's a lot of opportunity in the industry um, in terms of cybersecurity and some of the digital aspect. But it starts with us as individuals. So come out on social media, even if it's just as an advocate. Um, in New York is really hard. I'm used to markets where it's already like, okay, you're out. And then if you're a person of color, real talk, it immediately is like, okay, you use it. But be very clear about what your message is. Position it so that it's not perpetuating the old stereotypes. Not for nothing, I still, I'm from Brooklyn, I'm from East New York. Like, I still see someone like this, no thing what I do. At the end of the day, it's still a Brooklyn girl, but I am trying to dispel this. We are trying to dispel this. So ensure that you're not continuing to perpetuate those same stereotypes when you're actually passing along your messages. And how would one do that? I think really, uh, one, for example, I like to do things like, if you know, before you leave, take a selfie with someone. Here at this event, hashtag yeah. yeah. social media, absolutely. So I'm down to take a selfie. Yeah, you want to take a picture with the Yes, the <laughs> <laughs> Afro can be. Make sure you do that. I mean, I think at the end of the day, it's putting yourself in the story, becoming a uh, not a consumer in the in the sense that you're actually using, but someone who believes that consumers deserve the right to have a choice. So I think the main takeaway uh, is take out your phones at the end of this. Take a selfie. Kim has offered to, to take it with you. Uh, make sure to have Can of Gather in the background. Uh, put it on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And then spend somewhere between ten and fifty thousand dollars on ads uh, to, to highlight your work. Um, the last part is optional. Strongly Um, and so BDS Analytics, you, you sort of uh, got the got the poll started, uh, and um, do you want to drive or should I? 
I think there's a lot of slides and we've only got a few minutes, so maybe I should drive. Uh, I actually, I actually like, uh, okay. So I have a lot to guess. I have an awful lot of slides. We're gonna go through really quickly and uh, you know interrupt with questions if you have to, but otherwise save them for the end. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what consumers are buying, brands that are getting right, and who are those consumers. Um, so, you know, this is the lay of the land. Uh, we're all familiar with the adult use, medical use of the situation. This is what we do. We do point of sale uh, transactional data, which we gather from about a thousand dispensaries now. And we do consumer research based on comprehensive surveys, uh, multi-thousand people in those surveys. And then we can pull that information together and work with people like Tashida and a lot of uh, brands to figure out what they want to do next, okay? Um, we've uh, brought in more than 300 million transactions into our databases. And the important thing is we organize all of that data because there's weird descriptions that go in the point of sale systems and we figure out what that description really meant so that we can normalize and standardize all that data and categorize it all. Okay, in other industries, companies like IRI, Nielsen, NPD, which some of you will be familiar with. So we already have more than 100,000 items in our system. That's more than 1,700 brands. It's the most innovative industry in America right now in terms of production of new <coughs> products, new items, new brands. Spectacularly exciting. We synthesize some of this information in the form of the State of Legal Marijuana Markets book and the Cannabis Intelligence Briefings. Uh, so that uh, people know what's going on in the industry. So um, it looks like we might have a few problems with some of the slides, but we're all familiar with the very rapid growth of the industry in the United States, about $6 billion uh, already. In fact, we've just upped our number, breaking news here for 2017, the North American uh, market, so including Canada, um, is a $10 billion market. It's actually $9.7 billion. Okay. So that's actually about a billion more than we thought only about nine months ago when we came out with the first numbers. And that's partly because California is bigger uh, than we expected and we've got a lot more data on California. It's also that the other big markets have continued to grow more rapidly. You know, Colorado is continuing to truck along in terms of growth. Uh, so is Washington, so is Oregon. Um, and as you can see, the way that we get to our projections about the size of the market, which all have all increased, uh, we're literally uh, publishing our mid-year update tomorrow, um, we get to this $22 billion market, and it doesn't really need any future law changes, or hardly any future law changes. It's just going to happen because the legislators are implementing the will of the people now, or have implemented it, and because of the growth that's already there in the cannabis industry. So when you compare it, uh, to these spectacular industries like cable, broadband, access, home video, you can see legal cannabis is growing just as fast as those other big and powerful industries. And now we concentrate at the moment on those four states that represent about 75% of the US market. Uh, and you can see the breakdown is about 50% is in California. It's a big, big state. It's got a very mature, well-established medical market that is going to explode on January 1st of next year, of course. Um, this is the growth of the Colorado and Washington markets uh, and the Oregon markets. You can see adult use has grown very dramatically while the medical markets have remained relatively flat uh, since adult use came in. Uh, so what are the consumers buying? This should give you a bit of an illustration. Green at the bottom is the flower um, and then you're looking at the growth of concentrates and edibles. So flour back here was about 80% of everything that was being sold. This is Colorado, but it's very similar with the other states as well. Uh, now that's down to about 50% of the market. Not because flour has shrunk, flour has grown, as you can see. It's because concentrates are now 26 or 27% of the market. Edibles are about 14%, and pre-rolled products are 6 or 7% of the market. Now all of those sorts of products, of course, are branded products as opposed to flour, which is generally not branded. Um, so this means that consumer marketers are starting to think about conventional branding methodologies. Okay, this is how the categories have therefore evolved, as I just explained. And if we look at, yeah, these aren't going to work very well with, I hate the Apple thing, I don't mind it. Uh, 
Sorry, it's my fault. You sent me a PowerPoint, I opened it in Keynote. Sorry, it's my fault. It's beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> anyway, this is the breakdown between Colorado, Washington, Oregon. You can see very consistent patterns emerging in terms of the products that are being sold. You can see spectacular growth in some of those categories. You know, flour is huge, but grew at 18% in 2016 in Colorado. Um, edibles grew at 51%, concentrates that grew at 54%. So more rapid growth. Um, and you can see here within concentrates, vape up 90%, shadow up 60%, wax up 52%. So you can see this rapid evolution of the market, especially towards vape, vape being very popular um, in the adult use market, not so popular in the Colorado medical market at the present time where you know, shadow wax and resin are more popular. Um, here we can take a quick look at growth rates of some of those subcategories and you can see spectacular growth for some and not so much for other smaller fringe items and we come on to edibles and uh, here you can see edibles at 190 million dollars for 2016 and you see the break up there that candy is the dominant thing um, up about 75 percent but tinctures grew over 100 percent pills and tablets grew over 100 percent as well um, here moving on to uh, um, oh, we can just about make it out yeah difference between um, medical and adult um, on the edible side as well you can see chocolate is much more popular in the medical world probably because of the ability to have a much higher dose in chocolate um, and here you can look at the break breakdown of the candy market and you can see you know gummies up 100 percent it's by far the largest category with big brands like uh, warner driving that in colorado cushy punch driving in california um, here you can see a uh, breakdown of those categories and their growth rates so this is what's happened in washington so most of that data was about colorado now you can see a very similar trend in washington uh, since it got going and uh, concentrates are, uh, have outgrown the flower market. Again, here, this is what happened in Oregon when in Oregon allowed uh, the introduction of uh, concentrates and edibles in the adult use market. Um, you see this big bump that took place in June 16 where flower kind of went flat uh, and nearly all of the consumer demand went into concentrates and edibles. Uh, and then the uh, Oregon uh, regulators managed to screw up the process for a while and uh, not have enough laboratories to actually do the testing so a lot of the products had to get pulled off the market. It's now picked back up very nicely actually. Um, so what about California? It's obviously big. It's a long way away from here. It's uh, got similar category shares to, uh, to the other states, you know, 54% uh, there in the form of Flower, um, where I'm going to skip, 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 but you can get the uh, sense of how it's evolving. So, average selling price here, you can see in California, and concentrates about twenty-seven dollars. That's the weighted average of all of the concentrates products. Edibles are low priced, at about thirteen dollars. Flour about eight dollars and seventy-seven cents a gram. You can see Colorado five dollars and fifty-five cents. So significantly more expensive per gram for flour. I would say this is the area where municipalities are really struggling to figure out their own market because every market starts a little bit different based on where the black or the gray market started. Um, I found that this is the biggest challenge when we're building out our um, sort of assortment plans, potential uh, you know, unit sales. So make sure that you're not imposing such huge burdens on the companies and such high taxes on the companies that they can't compete with the great market. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, the comparison between the different markets is flower genuses in terms of um, categories uh, within tinctures and infused candy, etc. I'm really going as fast as I can in the respect of time. Um, you can see the differences between the different states, but generally we're seeing similar trends. Now, brands, I think it's very interesting. I mentioned earlier on that nearly all of the concentrates and edibles are branded. You can see branded products have grown spectacularly fast, over 500%. That's good, good news if you're into brand marketing, of course. Raise your hand if you'd like to, if you'd like Roy to go at whatever pace he feels like. 
Here we're actually looking at brand share, which is you know important to see how mature a market is and are the major brands already becoming dominant. And it's sort of interesting, isn't it, that you can see that uh, in, in uh, we're looking at edibles here, uh, the top five companies already have more than about 40% of the market. Um, and these are markets, Colorado, Washington, Oregon, relatively young market. Obviously, California is like a 20-year-old market. Um, but the others have dominated by the adult use that's only been there in four years. So in four years, some companies have got to 15 or 20% market share. And that means that they're generating 50 or 100 million dollars in revenue uh, already. And therefore, they're starting to look like mature companies, you know, and they have, um, you know, uh, experienced people on the board like the Sheila and others who are driving them forward and spending significant amount of money on, on marketing. Um, and here you can see similar brand shares in concentrates as well, even higher in Colorado and, um, and Oregon, where you have one or two dominant brands that have 30, 40, 50 percent, people like Open Bay, for example. Um, this is actually looking at those brands, but the data is not very clear. So um, it's the top concentrates brands and the growth rate. And you can see spectacular growth taking place in 2016. So, you know, who has been getting it right? Um, these are some of the top Colorado concentrate brands, so I'd encourage you to look at what they've been doing. They're among those leading players who've been launching effective products, uh, uh, attracting consumer demand, and getting their marketing right. And if you go to edibles, again, um, these are the top, I'm not gonna rank them, but these are the top uh, 10 players in Colorado. Uh, based on last year's sales. And then if we go to uh, Washington State, you can see the top edibles brands there in Washington. Yeah, this is all when the cameras come out. Everyone, uh, yeah. <laughs> he's not going to let me see that for very long. And uh, <laughs> the answer is I'm not that serious. This is some of the magic that comes out of our system, of course. Um, and here you can see the top concentrates brands. And here you can see Oregon uh, concentrate brands as well. You can see Select Strains, for example, has done spectacularly well as a company to uh, watch and understand. Um, people will also probably have heard of Chalice Farms doing extremely well as too. These are all in alphabetical order, folks. Not, not <laughs> <friendly. laughs> So here are uh, California Edibles brands. So as I said, they've had a bit longer to get going, to get to maturity. Of course, now they're looking with great excitement at the adult use market uh, and crossing over. But these companies, some of them have been around 10, 15 years and gradually built themselves up into this position. And these are the leading concentrate brands. As I said, the California companies, they think with an extra zero, they are their big companies relatively already. Um, so that was really my explanation of the trends that are going on in terms of product sales based on our Green Edge database. Um, we also do an extensive amount of consumer research as well. Uh, and, and, you know, the old adage among uh, consumer marketers is know your customer. So our clients came to us and said, okay, now I understand my market share and trends and trajectories and prices and all that. But I don't know who the customer is because I sell it to a dispensary and then the dispensary sells it and I just don't know who it is. Um, so we've been doing this in other industries for a long time. Um, so we started doing consumer surveys. So obviously, all of these people are bad people because uh, Jeff Sessions says so. So just be warned about that, you know. Uh, but 95% believe that uh, medical marijuana should be legalized uh, based on that survey. Now this is a profile, this is just an illustration, I'm not going to present this, but this is the kind of thing that we do so that you, when you build your brand or your dispensary, can target a particular type of customer and you can think about their daily, weekly activities, their income, their ethnic background, their education level, their age, etc. Um, and I think it's going to be very important. At the moment, it's more about getting your product on the shelves, but as you saw from the concentration ratios I was showing, it's going to be about competition among those 
major players. And uh, a key is usually to have identified a certain set of specific targets uh, that you want your products to go to. So this is just illustrating something about why do they consume, how frequently do they consume, um, and uh, whether they consume alone, interestingly, 58% consume alone. Uh, these are med medicinal consumers, self-described medicinal consumers in California. Um, so that told you a little bit about who those consumers are. They are, uh, we summarize, you know, happier than average. They make more money than average. Uh, they have more qualifications than average. This is true in, in California. It's also true in Colorado, Washington, and Oregon as well. Uh, they're more active, more social. Um, this is the, you know, in any other industry, you'd be delighted to have consumers of that, of that type. <laughs> they're gonna get the word out. Uh, here's just a little bit of data about uh, whether they consume, like 26% consume in California, um, and would, uh, a very limited number would not consider consuming, but we're interested in them as well. You know, why would you not consider consuming? We ask them questions, like, if your relative or someone you loved needed cannabis, would you get it for them? And the answer is usually yes. Yeah, I'm not personally interested in consuming, they'll say, uh, but I would love, uh, I would get it for a loved one. And this is about the frequency of consumption among those people who've consumed in the last six months. Um, and so, you know, to summarize, uh, past six months consumers are in California more likely to be millennials, but that doesn't exclude a very fast growing population of older people as well, who tend not to be such large consumers and tend to go for vaporizers and edibles. Uh, you can see, you know, relatively affluent, employed full time, well educated, married, very often parenting, like 58% medical consumers have children living at home in their household uh, and, and reside in cities. Um, health and medical motives are very important to them. Um, as well as, you know, social purposes, but a lot of it is associated with uh, wanting to uh, sleep better, relieve pain, manage stress, feel peaceful, and apparently um, have fun and be happy, which is necessary. <laughs> in Colorado. And my theory is that the California is already having fun and being happy, so they don't need, they don't need cannabis. Uh, preferred methods, uh, inhalation, edibles, and topicals, of course. Um, and many consumers are pairing cannabis with these kinds of activities, you know. Um, physical activity or exercise, three or four years ago when I was a complete newbie, I didn't really understand the association between cannabis and being able to train hard. I used to be a marathon runner, thank God I don't do that anymore. Um, but I now realize cannabis would have helped me with training significantly. And we also ask people, well, what are you doing differently since you've become a cannabis consumer? And uh, many said, I'm reducing my use of prescription medications. Uh, many said, less over-the-counter medications. Um, and a significant numbers said, I've reduced alcohol use. So we probe much deeper, much harder questions about these, because people tend to answer the survey the way you think they should answer the survey, you know, so that they're, they're virtuous people or something, and they feel better about themselves. Um, uh, so you probe a little bit deeper to see, well, how much did you actually change your behaviors? Um, and it's very significant with the reduction in use of uh, medications. Um, so, uh, that's about all I had to say. Um, I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me over here.
So we actually film that. Are we allowed to put that online? If not, that's sort of cool. Okay, the answer is Are you sure? No, we're, we're going to cut it. You guys saw it here. Uh, so thank you. When, when I said I think about what Liz, my business partner, said, I said, you said what? Okay. <laughs> it's it's going to get cut, um, but you guys saw it here. Um, so thank you so much for showcasing that. Uh, BDS Analytics platform is, is not uh, inexpensive, but I'm sure it's worth every penny. Um, yeah, but if you join the National Canvas Industry Association, you get a free version of all of this. Actually, virtually everything that I just showed that you could access. Now, we have a deeper level where you go down a brand and item level. That's for our subscribers. But a, a membership of NCIA is, what, $1,000 or something? Yeah. This is why I joined NCIA, to be perfectly honest. I joined for no other reason than to get the free data. Great job, and they get great job. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, NCIA, but that is legit the number one, number two, number three, and number four. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Jeremy and Aaron, if you're watching, uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is good or bad, but we're talking about NCIA, so it's good. It means it was a great uh, brand integration. I, think I agree. Great. We're talking good things about NCIA, but particularly about BDS. Um, so some, uh, I'm sure you have, I have a lot of questions, um, but that, that don't matter. So, uh, Rich, uh, ask away. Josh, question for, for both of you. Uh, given California, Colorado, so forth, bring it back to the East Coast. What do you expect in the way of growth here? Will be different? Different type of consumer? What, what are your expectations? Mm -hmm. I'd say <laughs> I'd say the consumer is going to be pretty similar to the consumer that we see in the other states. Now what's different out here is the restricted licenses and limited numbers of licenses that are, are being made available. So in Colorado we have 650 open dispensaries, in California there are over 3,000 dispensaries. Um, you're talking about Massachusetts having 80 or 90 eventually, and about 15 right now. Um, so. Uh, obviously that means that they're going to do much larger volume per dispensary, which means that they had to raise a lot more capital to do it, which also means they were able to bring in more experienced management, etc. and then presumably they might end up giving a, a superior service compared to uh, what used to be a little hole in the wall in Colorado, but is now consolidating into chains of fairly sophisticated dispensaries. Um, yeah, no, I'm inclined to agree that more or less maybe from a consumer perspective, not so much different, but I do think that the medical component or the health and wellness component is going to be a bit more paramount. Um, we're bringing a lot of education over from the West Coast to the East Coast. There's some things that since I'm spending so much time kind of going back and forth, just the East Coast don't play that on certain things, right? And so I think there's a little bit more um, regulation and regimen that's going to probably be um, involved in brand building. Um, and it's going to be a lot tougher because there's a lot more just a straight vertical system that have been set up in the state. So you may not be able to get into the actual touch the plant business, which is why I think we have um, so many people who are starting to innovate um, or just fill the white space available in the ancillary um, world. There's been a lot of talk about branded products. How do you see folks protecting their brands from being ripped off by someone else? So if someone's developed a brand and it's using it in, let's say, California, they thought they'd stand it to New York or New Jersey or Iowa or wherever, how are they protecting their brands? There's a lot of money in ancillary business of security for all of the industries, not just cannabis. There are always going to be bootleggers, right? So every single one. I mean, even the Target attire, <laughs> believe it or not, you'll find those uh, being pulled off a truck as well. So in this case, high levels of security really protect your brand to keep it from coming to the East Coast in a great market. But that's really the way it's flowing to the East Coast in that way. Um, but to be perfectly honest, without a standard of guys like way to say this is good bud or this is good cannabis there isn't anything right now that's going to prevent any innovation in my opinion from potentially being replicated uh, you can trademark certainly um, and you can go through process of um, 
licensing in some ways um, and, and, and be proactive and maybe uh, licensing your brand. Chom's Choice does that. They're going to different states, but they don't actually own the grow or cultivate. They license their brand to the cultivators because they know that they have brand equity. But more or less, the West Coast is a bit of a wild, wild west in that regard. There are some rules that aren't necessarily followed there. And I think we're already seeing some of the first lawsuits yes. around a particular trademark or not trademark in terms of whether it's been registered or not. And we'll see a lot more of them. And they're made, by the way, they're not like cannabis versus cannabis. They're Main Street versus cannabis. Oh. Starbucks was like, no, you can't call it a Dappuccino. And for years, they probably didn't even want to be in any media with cannabis. They're based in Seattle for years. But now, if you're a legitimate business, you have to legitimately accountable to the trademark law. Doesn't the uh, federal government prohibit trademarks for cannabis that's federally illegal? Yes. yes. For now they do, yes. For now they do, but um, that may change. Uh, that, is, that is a complicated question. Uh, I am familiar with trademarks in cannabis, as some of you know. Um, yes. Um, so uh, I think we're sort of getting kicked out uh, by Galvanize. Uh, yeah. So our after party, as you guys know, uh, is at Adoro Lay across the street. Happy hour prices on food and drink. Uh, are you guys going to be there? Absolutely. We're going. Awesome. All right, we're going to be there. Uh, two, uh, three quick things. One, our next event is January 16th. So get your early bird tickets now. Number two, uh, next to E-Tain people, I forgot to give them a shout out for our committee. And three, uh, Tim uh, has been doing this for almost three years now. Um, so shout out to Tim for uh, giving us a